Hello, hello. Ron Callis here with another episode of Automation Unplugged. Uh, we are here today for, uh, what is this? I think it's show 146. Can you believe it? Uh, today is Tuesday, November 24th. Uh, this is Thanksgiving week. So one of the ways that I am uh, giving thanks for each and every one of you that are my, my watchers and my listeners, my viewers, uh, is we're going to bring you two shows this week. And uh, excited to do that. So thus, the reason we're coming to you on a, a different day than normal and a different time than normal. Uh, additionally, my guests are coming to us from uh, Hawaii. And Hawaii, I'm here in Florida, and my, my guests are in Hawaii. And I, I want to say that our time zone is, is something like six hours, maybe plus or minus an hour, depending on daylight savings time. Uh, we're six hours or so apart. So I'm kind of balancing their schedule and availability to uh, to come on. Um, but I am going to uh, just kind of share one of the exciting little bits of news with uh, all of you. And I'm going to give you just a little bit of a tease of something that's to come. So you'll have to uh, you'll have to follow us. And here I already see uh, Chad. Uh, Chad, thanks for the uh, the the message there. He goes, yes, I'm pretty sure he's very excited about uh, our guest, which of course, let me just mention the guests are Pat and Phil uh, from the one and only Pacific Audio at Pacific Audio and Communications out of Hawaii. Um, but let me share my screen real quick because I want to show you guys. Uh, these are some of the images uh, that are actually of our most recent video shoot. So for those of you that are following One Firefly, you know that we are uh, we have a product called Mercury Pro uh, where we produce uh, what we believe are best in class websites for integrators. And uh, we had one of our staff, we actually shot here in South Florida. Uh, we shot for a day over at the Crestron Experience Center. And uh, we shot for a day at the Lutron Experience Center. And uh, these are some of the behind the scenes shots uh, on, uh, on that day. And this was just uh, a couple of weeks ago, beginning of November. And we've got all sorts of beautiful content. Uh, I'm going to keep the actual video of, uh, the, the real video. We're going to be doing a webinar in a few weeks, uh, sometime in December. And we're going to be unveiling all of this content to the world. Uh, so definitely stay tuned. So sorry, you're in these pictures. You're seeing bunches of pictures of Kendall and I, but uh, there you get, uh, you see a few pictures of some of our talent. And uh, there's Joe. He's the Crestron showroom manager there in Dania Beach. Uh, he was very generous to help us with the space. And we just had uh, overall a pretty amazing day, or, or a couple of days of shooting. So uh you guys will have to stay tuned, follow One Firefly on Facebook and Instagram, LinkedIn, all the normal spots, and uh, you guys will be able to hear about all of that new content. Again, stay tuned. We're going to do a webinar and uh, unveil all of these beautiful videos. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of brand new content that are going to make your websites and your marketing look amazing. But on that note, let me shrink my screen here. Uh, let me also just verify that we're coming in live. Yes, I'm pretty sure we are coming in loud and clear. It's pretty far down here on the feed. If you can see us and hear us, uh, there we go. All right, looks like we have some people liking, commenting. I'm struggling to find it actually on my... Facebook page, but I'm going to assume that technology is behaving and that it in fact is there. All right, there we go. I just refreshed Facebook. All right. Uh, and there I see Pat, uh, man, Pat is multitasking. He's already commenting. He says, uh, aloha, Ron, mahalo, mahalo from, uh, for having us on. So, uh, let's go ahead and say aloha to Pat and Phil. Let's bring them in for show number 146. Uh, with Pacific Audio and Communications of Hawaii. By the way, I don't think the word of is officially in their name. I just made that up. So uh, let me go ahead and, and bring them in now. 
there we go. And there we go. What's up, gentlemen? How are you? Aloha, Ron. Before we get started, virtually, typically, we would give the, the host a, a lay. And, and because you're not here, I'm just going to drape it over the camera. Or you know what? Better no, yet, no, you should wear it I'll for wear me. I'll wear it for you because you're not here. So, Ron, this lay is for you. Oh, that's very kind. So tell me, educate us non-native Hawaiians. What is the history of the lei? What What is the sy symbolic meaning of the lei? Oh, it, it's like aloha. It could mean multiple things. So in this case, because uh, you're inviting us as, a, as if we were coming to your home, uh, we would want to greet you with something. Like if you go to somebody else's house, you typically take a bottle of wine or something. In this case, the, this is that type of... Uh, greeting for you and uh a lot, most times when that greeting happens uh in the hawaiian culture they also do uh the ha so when you say aloha typically you're doing a, a forehead to forehead breathe you breathe in so that you feel connected together we're now with covid not so much but the typical uh ceremony for that in a greeting especially in this kind of situation we want to make sure that you are uh, uh basically told thank you for letting us come into your home and, and giving us this presentation. No, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, my parents, so I'm 42. My parents have been married for, I don't know, many, many years, 40 or 50 years now. And uh, when they were uh, newly married, where they went to have their honeymoon and where they did all their vacationing before they had all of us kids was in Hawaii. So there's all these old... Uh, uh, photographs of my parents, my mom and dad in Hawaii. And when they would get off the airplane, there'd be the row of people putting lays on the guests as they were coming off the, the airplane. And I, I remember those images very vividly. So, uh, so Pat, uh, why don't you go and introduce yourself and then let's get your brother introduced as well. Not a problem. Aloha everyone. Uh, Pat Mulligan, uh, Vice President and Business Development for Pacific Audio and Communications. Uh, I was fortunate enough to join my brother Phil in the business in 96 after uh, my stint in the Army uh, as an 82nd Airborne communications technician. That's kind of how my background in electronics came into play. Mm. Uh, went and got my degree from DeVry University, so I have a double E uh, in that. And was fortunate enough not to have to look for a job after that because Phil said, hey, we've got a you know pretty uh, good business going here and i need somebody that has that technical know-how to push us to that next level you know automation and stuff like that so i came on board jumped on with crestron been doing that since 97 and uh gotta thank phil a lot for giving me that opportunity to come back home no that's that's amazing keeping it in the family and phil you know it it was it was out of necessity that you know we went and met pat pat had uh, just graduated from Dravai and we flew up. He was in Arizona at the time. And uh, we flew up and sat down with him and said, look, we need you to come back. Um, you know, we got this opportunity. Um, you have some technical skills that, you know, that we need. Um, so, you know, I'd love you ha love to have you back. And, and they were looking for an excuse to get back and get out of Arizona area. So, we were really, really excited about him coming in um, and, you know, him jumping completely in headfirst into Crestron uh, at the time, you know, it, it was uh, pretty flooring that, you know, in early 90s, you know, what was happening and what wasn't happening in this. I was industry. the early days. I mean, they were just moving into the color touch panel. Was it still black and white, Pat? You're shaking your head. Well, I'm saying, yeah, you know, we were dealing with the, uh, it was, it was just as they had, had really moved into simple windows as, as we know it today. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, it was all DOS. And actually we had, Phil, if you remember, uh, uh, what's his face's house down in McKenna was DOS. Um, anyway. Yeah, so we, you know, it was just on that brink. But yeah, they had the monochrome out at the time. It was the, uh, the what CT one thousand or something like that. Uh, but yes. oh my goodness, I do remember. Was the CT one thousand black and white? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, they had. Oh, well, sorry. LC. LC was the the, the LC one thousand. I mean, and the CT was the color. That was around even into the early two thousands. Yeah. I mean, I I started there in 03, and there were still LC one thousands around. 
So that's, that's, that's interesting. Now, Phil, uh, you are, uh, the, you're the founder of the company. When did you found, uh, Pacific audio and communications and kind of, how did that all go down? How did that happen? So, uh, my background is electrical contracting and, um, I took over, my dad had an electrical contracting business here on Maui. And I took that over when I got back from college in, uh, uh 85. Um, and we did a lot of the high end residential, um, work that was here on Maui. Uh, and so we, there was a company here that was doing, um, you know, in ceiling speakers and, and security and central vac and, you know, phone and cable, you know, at that time there was no network. Um, and these guys, uh, were on most of the jobs that we were on and, and they, we're both from Seattle and they wanted to move back to Seattle. And so my original partner, uh, who was a, a general contractor and myself, uh, approached them and said, look, you know, what do you guys do? What vendors do you use? Um, and, and, you know, how do you do this stuff? And so we sat down with them for a couple of weeks and they went through a vendor list and, and we paid them some money for this information. And, we said, look, let me follow you guys on some jobs. So I went out and, you know, worked with them on some of their jobs for pre-wire and things like that. And we were on those jobs anyway, doing electrical. And um, I said, look, you know, we want to do this. You guys are leaving, um, you know, so let's move forward on this. And, and so that's how we started. And we started with just myself and, and this general contractor that would go out on a saturday or something and go do a, a job and um you know it just grew from there and at the time we were really the only guys on maui that were doing this work uh there were a couple of companies on oahu that were doing um you know this work and they were flying over you know they were flying guys over to do it um and so we i at the time i was flying running, guys over from california or from the states from oahu Oh, from Oahu. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there was a couple of guys, you know, a couple of companies over there. And I remember sitting in some meetings um, and we had just kind of started Pacific Audio and sitting in some meetings with some of the guys that flew over from Oahu and just floored on, you know, what, what they were providing for these clients, you know, because I had never seen any of that stuff. I mean, CDs were just, you know, coming out in, in the late 80s. Um, you know, I remember seeing the first CD player on a job we probably did in, I think, 84, 85, something like that. And I'm going, what is this thing, you know? And um, so just technology changing, you know, from, you know, in the early 90s, we were using, you know, cassette decks and, and multi CD players and VCRs, you know, till where, you know, DVD first kind of started showing up in, in the late nineties. Um, so it, it, it's been an interesting ride. <laughs> uh, uh, Phil, the idea or the, the concept of the custom integrator, the systems integrator, is that what uh, Pacific audio has always been since the beginning? I mean, have you been a systems integration firm for the last 30 years or did that really change or migrate to more of that? I mean, did you start as an electrical contracting firm that added or that became a systems integration firm or are you both today? No. So, you know, Malco Electric was the electrical contracting company. Malco means mountain. And that's where we grew up on Maui it was up country. So that was, that was a appropriate name, but we did work all over the Island. And, um, I had, you know, I ran Malco Electric and it, it ran until uh, we shut down in 2002 just because I couldn't justify doing the electrical work and the AV work that I was passionate about, more passionate than the electrical work. So um, I think from the get go, we had to be custom in, in AV work because that's all that there was. I mean, there was, you know, volume controls and speakers, but you wanted anything further than that, you had to go out and find it. Um, and, and then, you know, start using relays and doing this kind of stuff just to, to make things work 
to have them work the way the clients wanted them to work. And there, there wasn't a lot of off the shelf stuff. So we were customing you know, even before, you know, there was such a, a term of called integrator. Um, it, it, you know, and that's the thing. I mean, electrical, you know, we, we would still, if we were wiring electrical today, we would still wire the same way. You're still using the same Romex and, you know, the codes have changed, you know, and so there has been advances in that, but the actual physical and what you're doing hasn't really changed. Unlike, you know, AV work and what we're doing now, it changes every six months. And so that was what excited me about it was, you know, I hadn't seen any true advancements in electrical work, you know, in 20 years, you know, other than code changes. Um, so, you know, it was that excitement factor of, of this thing constantly changing that really drew me to that. Now, Pat, I, a lot of, from my uh, experience, uh, many of the integrators that have a foundation in electrical contracting, usually they are more prone to focus uh, at least uh, maybe a larger percentage of their flow in lighting control, just because you're comfortable with high voltage and low voltage. Is that the case with you guys uh, or kind of what, what's your approach to, to lighting control within your, your business mix? I want to say, you know, Phil was probably one of the first guys doing Lutron. I don't know, Phil, when, when did you jump on Lutron? I mean, you guys were doing it at Smith's when I showed up in 96, 95, 96, right? Yeah. So the graphic what, eye, but. So the first lighting control job we did was Vantage and it was uh, 92, I think. And it was, it had to be uh, pre-programmed from the factory. It wasn't something that you could <laughs> physically change on in the field. Um, all the button presses, all the scenes, all the load assignments, everything was pre-configured from the mothership. Yep. And what about change orders? That, it was difficult. I mean, <laughs> that sounds like a nightmare. So, I mean, the amount of paperwork that you had to do, first of all, to, to get that to Vantage you know, was astronomical. Um, and mm. the, the the first, we ended up going back and upgrading that job almost after it was, com just after it was complete because the new system was so, you know, you could go in and change, make all these changes and stuff. And so the infrastructure was there, the same infrastructure was there and needed, but the processor and, and other things, you know, we were able to change out just so the client could have, you know, a more user friendly and, and we could change things easier for them. And I don't remember what that system was called. Um, and it was precursor to, uh, to Q links. And I, I don't remember what it was called, but we, we, we had, we had to have a guy from vantage fly out, and commission the system you know and he was there you know helping us terminate things and stuff like that and and then he would take back any of the changes that we needed done he'd take it back they'd go and, and do it at the factory they'd send us a floppy disk <laughs> of the changes we would have to go in and I, I, I don't even remember how we connected to it i don't know if it was us wasn't usb like Comport, might have, maybe. It might have been Comport or something. I forget. Um, and and load those changes to it. Um, so yeah, it, it was. It's it's been a, a journey. That's that's amazing. And Pat, you you're you were the Crestron guy. Sounds like from day one. And I know you're still the Crestron guy. Um, now this is, I generally don't ask, ask product mix questions. So I'll just answer this in the, whatever politically correct way you need to do this, but it, are you guys doing all Crestron or is it one of the things that you guys do? Uh, it's, it's and one of the tools, you know, we also do control Four. have been now for four, five years, four years now, Phil, something like that. But yeah, yeah Crestron. About four, I, mean, I mean, we, we were there when Barry Coons and Mark Levecchia and, and Shelly all opened the West coast office. You Shelly know, Flynn. They, yeah, they were our trainers. They, they would come out, uh, Barry would come out once a year for about a week. 
we'd fly all the teams in out, you know, to Maui and we trained for a week and, and it was awesome. You know, it was, it was easier for us to help pay that one person to come in than it was to try and send, you know, 10, 12 guys up there. So it just made sense uh, at that time. Um, but yeah, we were, we've been involved since, you know, at least the West coast open. How are they, just curious how maybe they, th as vendors, how are all these companies handling training? I know that, you know, forever you guys would all have to maintain your, your training and certifications year after year. And it was, I, I want to say it was common for you to have a pilgrimage to the factory for some sort of regular updated training. What's happening now with COVID? Yeah. So a lot of that is, has pushed to virtual, you know, very similar to what we're doing right now with your podcast. Um, Crestron has really ramped up their uh, training program and, and I'd say about 80% of it is virtual where you can do it on your time. Now the certification classes are different. You, you've got to do that. Uh, it's virtual, but it's live. You know, you're in, you're, you're, you're basically sitting at your home or your office and you're logging into one of their processors somewhere in Texas or you know, wherever it is. Um, so so you're actually programming and configuring and affecting a processor Correct. that virtual somewhere. out in the cloud correct. somewhere correct correct so and our guys love it because now we can tell them hey look at the time frames most times again logistically running a business in hawaii is a lot different from what you guys do on the mainland one because of the time differences and one hour for us it makes a big difference when that time shift happens with daylight savings time so t <laughs> tell me more about that i've heard i've heard you 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 talked to me about this in the past so share like what are the stresses on your business because of daylight savings time Technical support will be the biggest, one of the biggest ones, because when you guys on the East Coast are shutting down, we're just waking up. <laughs> Honestly, it is just, it's just right it's now. Is it? It's, so it's four twenty three p.m. ish it's 11, right now. It's Eleven twenty three here now. Now you guys are five in the East Coast. You're five hours ahead of us during daylight savings, which happens in March. We'll it's go six. To six. That okay. one hour time difference, it's a pain in the butt. Do you I, not have daylight savings in Hawaii? Isn't that messed up? Like it's different. <laughs> it. <laughs> it's such a mess. Like, yeah. why does that exist? Yeah. yeah. No idea. No idea. Some, yeah. some bureaucrat somewhere at yeah. some time thought that was a good idea. Yeah. Pat, what, what are some of the other differences of running a business in on a, you know, an Island state? Like well, it's not again, the same as it is here. Yeah. So Hawaii, for those that don't know or haven't heard, but Hawaii is, is the most isolated populated isolated place in the planet we're five hours at minimum to get to the mainland right so california uh, la whatever the case may be so those logistics need to be figured out uh, freight and all those kind of things can be a major pain in the butt um you know if, if we need something rushed there is no thing as overnight here it's zero it's just not going to happen so we're at best two to three days and uh, you know some guys that come in from the mainland to do work here and there's quite a few of them that do They'll end up reaching out to us because they either forgot something or it's not going to happen overnight to see if we've got those things. Um, so it, 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 a lot of people start learning that those logistics here are completely different. You don't truck something here. It ain't happening. It's not going to happen. So I, those type of things become uh, 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 we, we get used to it over amount, of, you know, over time. Phil and I are just like it is what it is. And we've never, we don't think twice about it because that is a logistical part of our business. So, so tell me why, uh, and, and I'll, I'll direct this to you, Pat, and then I'm going to jump down to you, Phil. But Pat, why when a customer calls in for service and if they give you their address, why why is that not enough information? <laughs> <laughs> and that's another logistical nightmare because, and again, we talked about this a little bit ago on our, our pre-setup, but uh, it's Hawaii has, again, for whatever reason, each eye, like Kailua. Right? We're going to use that because it's a perfect example. There's a Kailua on the Big Island, there's a Kailua on, on Oahu, and there's a Kailua in Kauai. So if somebody says, hey, I'm in Kailua, okay, that which island is this? That's more important to us. What island are you physically on? So they're right. on each island. You can have the same city. So the same city might be on two or three, four different islands. Yeah, even the same roads. So the same city, the same house address literally could be on four different islands yep and whose fault is this not mine <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're gonna blame the missionaries for that one yeah, yeah i i think that that sounds yeah. that sounds it, wise it, i mean there, there's so many idiosyncrasies here that people don't 
I mean, you wouldn't even think, you know, of that happen here that can cause and will cause delays, you know, strange, strange things happen. I mean, so shipping, you know, and Pat had, and mentioned this, you know, we have to order stuff at least two months before we need it sometimes, depending on what it is. If it's shades, it's easily two months. Um, and it's different per island. Now, Oahu, so it, it, all the, everything gets shipped basically from California to Oahu. And then it gets parsed out from Oahu to the outer islands. So then it gets taken out of the container, put into a different container, add other stuff into it, and then it gets shipped to either Maui, the big island, or Kauai. Um, so then you got to add, there's another week to, to add to your shipment issue. So if, if it's going to be two to three weeks to Oahu, you got another week to get it to the outer islands. Um, and then it's usually three or four days for them to break it down out of the container once it gets to the island, get it to the freight forward company, and then them call you and go, hey, we got this stuff, we want to deliver it. Um, so logistically, it becomes, you really need to know your schedules and when your project needs to be completed or when you need these items, because then you got to work your way backwards and go, okay, I need these items at this date. Okay, I got to work two months back. You know, if it's air freighting, then, you know, if, if it's ground, it's, oh, seven days maybe. I mean, if you want to do, you know, and try and get it here quicker, like Pac said, the fastest I've ever seen anything is two days. And that's if it leaves California in the morning. And it has to be a certain day. It has to be like Tuesday or Wednesday. It will, if it leaves California in the morning, their time in the morning, we will possibly get it by Friday in the morning, depending on when they deliver. So FedEx UPS usually delivers to our location about 12 to one in the afternoon sometimes. Um, so yeah, it, it logistically shipping is a, is a major hurdle, major hurdle. Um, and, and like Pat said, time frame on, on tech support. So if, if we're trying to call East coast in daylight savings time, we have to call them by 10 o'clock our time or else they're closed. Mm. So, uh, you know, you're, you're on a job at, you know, three o'clock our time, you know, you're stuck, you're stuck until the next morning. Who, Phil, who are your customers? Are these local, um, are these locals that are building nice houses or I know you do resi and commercial. So maybe you start there. What's your mix resi and commercial. And then who are the customers? Are they locals? Or are they people that this is their vacation home? If they're resi, what, what is the business look like? Um, it, it, our mix is probably about 75, 25. So 75 residential, 25 commercial. Um, and, I would say 90% of our residential is part-time residents. So second homes, um, vacation homes that they have here. We do have, um, you know, a handful of clients that initially were uh, part-time residents that have now moved here that are here full-time. Um, and we're starting to see, I think, and we're probably going to start to see more of an uptick of people that are moving here and will do, uh, work remotely. Mm. Um, and, you know, most of it would be, you know, Silicon Valley people, California people, maybe Oregon, Washington um, type people and businesses. Are you seeing um, real estate pick up or are you, I mean, are you seeing a, a COVID effect? Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there's very little inventory right now in certain price ranges. Um, so the, uh, million and a half to three million price range. There's no inventory or very little. And the super high, you know, over 10 to, you know, 10 plus, there's hardly any inventory. 10, ten to sky's the limit. Yeah. Um, and I, almost every week I'm getting pinged a couple of times from Hawaii Business News 
that you know some huge estate just sold for thirty million dollars on Kauai, or some huge estate sold on Oahu for twenty five million, or you know something like that. So there's there's a lot of activity now. Commercially, it, you know that is is taken a hit. You know a lot of the commercial businesses or, or properties are are having a hard time filling those spaces. Um, and you know we've Maui has the the largest unemployment rate in the state, and I the last I think we looked we were at about twenty two percent unemployment. Wow, why is the oh that had to be from the hotel industry? It's all the hotel industry, hotel and hospitality, hospitality all the the tour companies, all Joe. the restaurants. You know that. That has you know, to be we'll, devastating for so many people in your society. I mean, the upper end, right, of society, and I don't mean they're better. I just mean they have more money. They're doing fine. Uh, but so yeah. 22% uh, yeah. without jobs, that's, yeah. I mean, that's devastating. Yeah, it's, it's huge. I mean, there's constantly, you know, food drives, you know, for people that are out of work. They're, you know, the, the counties have really stepped up um, and thrown a lot of money at you know the businesses that are hurting the most um and you know sad to say we've seen you know some restaurants that have been around for 20 some odd years that will not return um you know and and we have started to open up um you know some of the hotels some of the larger hotels have opened some of the larger ones will be open december 1st um so we're starting to Oh, Pat, I think we no, lost um, him. No, so no, that's, that's so okay. Yeah, yeah I, sorry. Yeah, um, we're starting to see that activity return, uh, but very slowly. And we're trying to be very cautious about, you know, we, we can't afford to have our case numbers go up. We have one hospital on Maui and there are only, I think, 60 ICU beds and, you know, only so many ventilators. And that could be overwhelmed very, very quickly. And so, you know, the counties are very, very serious. The governor very serious about, you know, allowing people in, um, making sure they have negative tests. They did just um, revise their testing requirements um, as of a couple of days ago that uh, if they were allowing people to get on the plane if they had taken a test and they didn't have the results yet and come in and if the results came in, then they could stop quarantining. Um, the problem that I have with that is somebody gets on the plane and they've, they've had people that have gotten here and, and they, they get a positive test. So now everybody on the plane has been exposed to that person. Right. And now yeah, that seems kind of sloppy. That certainly is not what yeah. Hawaii was known for, for most of this period. I mean, you guys had probably some of the strictest yeah. quarantine rules in North America, at least to my knowledge. And it was easy for us to do because you can't get here unless you get on a plane, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so, um, yeah, I, I think they're going to even revise that. So, so what it got revised to now is, is you can get on a plane without a test but you're going to have to um, quarantine the whole time, either 14 days or the length of your stay, which is ever shorter. So it's kind of trying to uh, have the, them understand that we really don't want you getting on a plane without a negative COVID test. Um, yeah. And I don't know legally if the county can force somebody or, or, or have, you know, prevent somebody from getting on a plane. I don't know the legality of it. And I think maybe that's why it's worded the way it is. Um, Seems but, like it would have to do with the originating the location, airline. the originating airline or airport. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because it being a private entity, a private business, even though some of them are public with, you know, stocks and stuff like that, the airline would have to be the one that says that. Yeah. The, it, it's gotta be some, there's gotta be some legal thing that they couldn't word it and say, you can't, get on a plane, you know, unless you have this. So the way around it was, okay, you can get on the plane, 
But if you don't have it when you get on the plane, then you're 14 day quarantine, no matter what happens. Mm. Um, so they were, again, it, it, the verbiage and the way they did it, I think is just a, a reason of what legally they can do, I think. Phil, uh, 2020, will your business be up or flat or down over 2019? So I looked at our numbers uh, a couple of days ago and we're about um, 12% down from where we were in uh, 2019 currently. So we have another you know, month to, to try to make that up. And I think we'll, we'll make some of that up, but we're, I, I have a feeling we're gonna be down maybe 10%. Um, and it's not that the projects have stopped, it's the projects have been delayed. Mm. Um, so things that we were supposed to be finishing in September, October are now finishing in February, March. Um, and more, more of the COVID push, you know, a lot of yeah. it got shut down and things got, got pushed. Yeah. Pat, I want to, I'm going to put something on the screen. I want you to tell us what it is. There we go. And for my <laughs> podcast listeners, I've got, a a bunch of army dudes with military fatigues and painted faces and guns and total bad assery all the way around. So uh, what, what, what am I seeing here, Pat? So that is the team I was assigned with. Uh, I won't say which one I am. And Ron figured it out. Uh, I gave him a little hint. I am in the back row, non mustache. I'll, I'll say that. Uh, but I was fortunate enough. This was in 89 and uh, I was a communications operator coming out of Fort Bragg and attached to one of the Robin Sage groups that does training uh, for the special forces. So the special forces group is, is the, the background uh, in front of me or in front of us uh, kind of kneeling there are all the tier one guys or what everybody knows the SEAL Team 6. So our mission at that time was to get Noriega out of, out of country um, you know, as, as a dictator. Our, that team right there was basically the team that made that happen. And uh, I was very privileged to be able to work with them. We did a night jump, <clears throat> excuse me, in, uh, in very early in the morning. And I, we met up with the tier one group. Half the group went after his plane uh, uh, helicopter and the other half went after his boat because they knew if, they, if he got to those devices, then he'd probably be gone or have some kind of place to, to find asylum. And did they go to destroy those, those devices yeah. or what was oh, their yeah. intent? Yeah, you can look, you know, one thing that Trump did is he, he released a lot of the documentation that we can all go look at now. So if you look up Operation Just Cause, you're going to see a lot of these photos and you will get, you know, the, the true story of what happened down there. Uh, a lot of people are like, oh, it was a war, this, that, and the other. Yeah, well, yeah, there was a lot of damage. There was some, you know, deaths and stuff like that for sure. But it was, it was a skirmish to get him out of there. And for those that are old enough that remember, he ended up taking asylum into the, the church that was there, uh, which is a sanctioned state at that time that NATO, we couldn't go into. Uh, you couldn't I, go into the church building? No. As a, as a sanctioned state at that time, via NATO laws, we could not go in. So what we could do, though, is we shut the power off. Um, we, we allowed no food in or out. We had let the priests know that we're not there for them. We're not there to destroy their building. We're not there to do any of that stuff. And that, that wasn't me. That was somebody else much higher up that, you know, did the negotiations with that. But they, you know, they basically came out and they understood that. And about three days later, because he had no water, he had no food, he basically came crawling out and surrendered. I mean, that, that was how it all played out. And, I and was you were there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So how did this experience? So in the military, what were your what was your job and how did that lend itself to you joining your brother from an integration standpoint? Perfect segue. Uh, as I mentioned, I was a communications radio operator uh, at the time. So I was in charge of all the comms, all the, the communications between our uh, SF team and the tier one team. And of course, all the upper brass to understand what was going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Uh, back then, we were just just on the brink of getting into digital. So my 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 MOS or my military occupational specialty was as a 31 uh, mic, which was an analog side. And then right around 8990, it switched to 31 Delta, which was the digital side of the communications. So I was knee deep in it. I mean, my life expectancy during a war, as far as comms goes, I think it was like 15 seconds. It was it was ridiculous. 
So I was the guy or my team was part of that team that kept the communications uh, in order so that all teams could talk, to, you know, and the upper brass. So that was kind of my lead in when I got out. I had the GI Bill that I could use, uh, which paid for my DeVry schooling. So I got my double E from DeVry and really honed in on the component level repair side of things because that was still prevalent back then. So soldering and boards and schematics and all that kind of stuff. And then when Phil kind of presented, hey, we've got this thing going on on Maui, it seems to be taking off. We need somebody that has a little bit more of that, that engineering background to, to take us to that next level. Uh, and at that point, we started researching, okay, Crestron and AMX and Fast and Ponda, which we were all involved with, uh, was, was in my wheelhouse because of that, that training. And I was able to bring a lot of that training, uh, not only on the technical side, but also on the logistical side, because I had to run teams of, you know, 15 or 18 or 20 people. So a lot of the logistical knowledge that I got from that military training was able to cross over uh, into a, a personal business. I, I go back to my early days at Crestron and my first day at Crestron was in uh, at Cedia 2003. And I remember it was like literally day one. And I, I got to, I was interacting with a customer and I was talking about Crestron's PVID. Yeah. Remember the PVID and mm -hmm. the, the pad eight and the bipad. And I remember Fred Bargetzi was there with Joel, uh, 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 George Feldstein. And yep. there was the customer. So there was me, the brand new guy, like raw, right out of uh, yesterday. I was at Lutron today. I'm at Crestron. And, uh, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what any of these black boxes were, but I remember, uh, Fred, uh, telling me that, and, and I want to say the analog world still lasted a few more years yeah. before everything went to digital media. And, uh, but I remember a conversation vividly about there was going to be a digital transformation coming. And well, we saw that in, in the service because that industrial side sees it before we do on the resi side. And even some, even before. I was say, it sounds like you saw it in the military even years before it made it to the commercial side of things. Yeah. Yes. You know, that, that transition, that's, that's pretty fascinating. All right. So then I've got one more crazy, my, my research team uh, dug up one more image. So you, you have to, you have to tell me what's going on here. And, and I'll let Phil talk about that one. <laughs> what, 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 what do we got here? There's I don't know. What are we looking at? Phil, it's the picture with Sammy and dad. Oh. So I, 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 you know, my team finds all sorts of fun content. Well, I, don't know, when I'm Uncle Tony? I don't know who's next to him. No, that's not Uncle Tony. Um, so I, I've got a picture of Sammy Davis. Looks like he's in some swim trunks. Yeah. Uh, not much to the swim trunks. No. And, uh, and I guess this is your dad. Yeah, that was, so we used to go, uh, so originally we are from New Jersey. Um, and as a family, we would go and um, vacation down in St. Thomas. And this was prior, that picture was prior to uh, the family being around. Prior and, to me. Yeah, and, the, and my mom and dad would go down to St. Thomas and Puerto Rico and, and party up with, you know, their friends. And that's the uh, Rat Pack days right yeah, there. I mean, he's yeah, hanging and, out with Sammy yeah. Davis and maybe some Frank yeah, Sinatra. So that, who that knows was, who else? That was probably early 60s, you know, probably 59 or 60, somewhere in that area. And they were, the story I heard was they were at uh, somebody else's party. And um, they said, hey, Sammy's in town. And he's throwing this big party. Let's go crash it. <laughs> and they go and crash a party that Sammy Davis Jr. was throwing. And if anybody, you know, my dad was the, the type of person that if, you know, he was in a room with 25 people and that he never met, uh, all 25 people, those, uh, those people within 30 minutes would be his best friend. And so he, he would be able to go to those types of things and become, you know, uh, know everybody in that party within and, and not get kicked out. Most and not get kicked out. Yes. So That's... that, that was his, his MO that he was very good at that. And um, I was not surprised to see that picture 
you know, with him uh, and Sammy. <laughs> That, that's I appreciate you letting me take that sideways there a little bit. No, no problem. Uh, walking down the path with me. So, Pat, you guys are doing all these projects all over the islands, uh, or the the state of Hawaii and all the islands. How many how many islands make up Hawaii? I know well, there's if you include Vegas. There's nine. <laughs> if you include Vegas, there's nine. And uh, I know you guys also do work in the states. I know you did a really amazing winery, an award winning winery in California. Um, but it, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about the, the winery in California and kind of how that job, how that job got won. But then I, I want to spin it back to actually doing work on an Island. Um, you guys are, uh, uh, fall vulnerable to hurricanes, salt spray, all sorts of, uh, conditions that maybe some of the folks listening don't have to deal with on their projects. And I'd, I'd love to just hear how you guys think about that and how what maybe you do that's different or how you prepare for some of the harsher conditions. Sure. Tsunami oh. tsunami is another one. Yeah. Tsuna yeah. Yes, you do have tsunamis. You have tsunamis, hurricanes, all sorts of- We got of, the whole gambit. That's well, that's unfortunately right. enough with my, my, my involvement uh, with the Air Force Auxiliary now uh, and Silver Air Patrol, I have some pretty good ends with the Emergency Operations Center here on Maui. It's nice because I get a lot of the, you know, information prior to the, the public getting it, so I can forewarn our teams, and so you know, it's one of the perks of having that and being involved with that organization. Um, but to answer your question uh, on the Del Dado side, we've actually got to go back to '97 when we did a project in, in Mountain View uh, with a company called Amazing Controls. Uh, they're not, they're no longer around, sadly. Uh, but the client at the time became Myra, really good family, really good client, still really good friends with them and the sons. He had something out in mid nineties that Crestron AMX did not have. They were doing ethernet controlled systems well before all of those guys. And he had, he had a very good in on that. And it was more on the industrial side, um, because they were doing, they were trying to compete against Johnson control. That, that was their main thing. Um, <clears throat> so we ended up doing BK's house in, in, uh, uh, Mountain View. He had a house here in Lahaina, and we also did their house in Nice in France. And he wanted, the, the, they didn't have the hooks for the IR and stuff like that. They had the, the IP side of it figured out, uh, but they didn't have those. So he wanted to team up with somebody that did Crestron. And we did the front end of the Crestron, and they did the back end programming and tied it all together uh, with amazing control. Um, so anyway, fast forward somewhat, uh, one of the lead managers for them uh, Brett Call, who is a partner of ours in Northern California, and we we have a couple of other projects coming up, including Phase Three and Four of Del Dado. Uh, Brett got us involved with this because he was able to champion uh, the control processing side of that and integrate with Crestron. So that whole facility, if you look at it from the front end, looks like Crestron, uh, like Crestron Lighting, Crestron Audio Video, the whole nine yards. What Brett brought into play was the industrial side that you're looking at now, where we were actually looking at for fermentation tanks and allowing these guys, meaning Del Dado and their management, to remotely look at statuses, to deal with um, energy management and facilitating those type of things. Um, and to date, we are we're saved, not we, but the system is saving about 15% just on energy management. And Dave has been a proprietor for this whole thing and trying to sell prior to COVID uh, other wineries because he's not, you know, somebody that, that care, you know, he cares about his winery, but he's not worried about competition. He's worried about how do we take care of this? How do we make this sustainable? And his facility is one of the first ones in the Napa area that has this system. Um, so that's kind of how that came about. And like I said, we've got other stuff going on, again, barring COVID for phase three and four. Uh, we're also in discussions with other wineries for very similar applications because they see that benefit. I'll let Phil chime in on the other half that your your other question about logistics out here and the weather and how to deal with speakers and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Phil. Phil. Weather conditions. What do you guys do different, or how do you prepare for that? Um, you know, it, it's one of those things that you know a lot of the manufacturers have now really upped their game on. You know, especially. Uh, you know, salt issues and things like that on, on oceanfront properties. Um, you know, prior, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I mean, nobody had anything that would last any amount of time outside. I mean, and you guys in Florida have the same issue, you know, on oceanfront, 
you know, with salt, uh, you know, getting into And the hurricanes, just not the tsunamis. The <laughs> we don't have the tsunamis going on here. <laughs> well, I mean, so, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, when you, you know, somebody that comes to Hawaii vacations or whatever, or even if we have, um, you know, we, we bring in talent from the mainland or whatever to work for us. Um, you know, the first, uh, first of every month, you know, you have siren warnings, right? And if, if you're not used to that, I mean, I don't know if that happens on the mainland anywhere, but I mean, this, you know, you're, you're like, what, what is that? You know, what's going on? You know, and, and those are, you know, typically for, you know, weathered events, hurricanes or tsunamis, you know, so, uh, and, and we've had a couple of scares in the last 10 years, you know, that could have been really devastating that just, thank God, weren't. Um, but, you know, w sirens were going off, you know. And it then, goes off at the beginning of every month or only when there's an no, event? No, it's testing. So they want it, they test once a month, the first of the month at noon. So whatever the first of the month is, you know, um, at noon, the sirens go off to test. You'll walk out and be, yeah. you know, like, full yeah. on. and if you don't know, yeah, if you're you hitting the deck. You're, yeah, you're, you're, and so a lot of the tourists that come, you know, if they're if they're not told by you know the the hotel staff or whatever, they kind of freak out a little bit. Um, you know, but you know we're kind of used to it, um, except you know when you get a text on a Saturday morning, incoming ballistic missile. Um, this is not a drill. Take cover. So I don't, I don't know if you, heard, you might remember, you remember that. about that. I, I've heard about this. I heard about, you know what? I listened to a podcast where your governor was interviewed by Guy Kawasaki. Yeah. And I, I, and the, I, the details are not crystal for me, but I remember hearing about this. So maybe go ahead. And for those that are listening now, they're like, what the heck are you guys talking about? So what, what happened? So I, I it was, what is it maybe two years ago pat yeah just something about. like that on a saturday morning i get up and i'm i was making coffee or whatever so it was early it was you know six, seven o'clock yeah it's just six thirty seven somewhere in that time frame and so um typically what will happen is if there's a weather event your phone will make this hideous noise and I don't know if it, if you guys have this in, in We do, Florida. like if there's an amber alert or yeah, something right. like that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you, it makes this weird like sirening noise. And yeah. And then the text shows up and I'm like, okay, I mean it's a beautiful day, it's sunny. I'm like, it can't be hurricane. And I didn't hear anything about tsunamis happening, right? And I'm like looking at my text and it's the text says uh incoming ballistic missile alert. This is not a drill. Take cover. Holy, did you crap your pants? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, just, I'm staring <laughs> at this do? thing. Yeah, what do you do, right? My wife is sleeping and my son is getting up and I'm just like, uh, like staring at this numb. Like, what? what are you talking about? You know? And then so I, what do I do? I go to you go online, right? Try and find out, you know, try and confirm this online. I can't find anything online. So okay, let's go to let's go to CNN, right? Nothing on CNN. I'm like, oh, let you're me like go we're to, not at war, so yeah. <laughs> what's going on here? Let me go to the radio, right? So I go out to my car, right, and turn on the local radio station, right, and there's nothing there. I'm like, what is going on, right? So I don't know. A couple of minutes later, right, then I start hearing on the radio. We don't know what this is. We we're not sure but take cover because it could be real, you know? And we're just like, what the, and so now we're standing here going, okay, what do we do in a, a nuclear attack? Right? Nobody knows, right? There's, I mean, there's maybe one facility here that's underground that you could get into, right? And that's in Wailuku. That's like, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes away, right? And when we all know, okay, you know, that it's i think there's like 16 to 20 minutes between launch and and devastation and so i'm like 
but what am I going to do? There's nothing I can do, you know? And then my wife gets up. She's like, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. I just got this, you know? And so finally information starts to dribble in like in 20 minutes going, Oh, it's, it's not, you know, somebody pressed the wrong button <laughs> in the civil defense thing on Oahu yep. on Oahu. And now like they're, they're showing video of people taking, you know, local kids on Oahu, opening up drain, uh, stormage drain things, thro throwing people, kids into these storm drains that are concrete encased, you know, and just people going crazy, you know, people on the road trying to get somewhere that they think may be safe, uh, which there's, you know, really no place, you know, to be safe. Now, you know, I would imagine detonation would be over Oahu because that's where all the military bases are. Then what's the fallout going to be outer island wise? Which way is the it? wind blowing? Yeah. Right. What a, I mean, wow. Just a, you know, for 20 or 30 minutes of, you know, you know, and somebody, in fact, I think my sister found out about it. She's in on the East Coast and calling me and, you know, saying goodbye to me. And I was like, what, the, what, are, what, what, what's happening, you know? And I know for a fact that, you know, some people here called their relatives on the mainland and said goodbye to them, you know? That has to be absolutely one of the more Surreal. terrifying things Just, I've ever heard. It, and, you know, again, for 30 to 45 minutes, we thought it was real. Um, and it, it was like, wow. P Pat, what was that like for you with all your military connections? I'm assuming you're like dialing the bat phone for people I, that are supposed well, to know. It, it, interesting you mentioned that. I'm seeing a couple of our uh, our CAP members are on listening, but uh, and they're going to chuck. I'm one of the comms operators for, for the squadron here, and I had the UHF VHF radio. There was no chatter. I went back to sleep. <laughs> I was like, what? something's up. Something's, something's, something's not right. And I literally was like, what are we going to do? Even if it was real, tell me where it's going to land because I'm just going to take my family and go stand under it. You know what I'm saying? Because there's not much you can really do, especially in Hawaii. We're so limited on resources. And it's not like we can pick up and, you know, get in our, get in a Ferrari and go 400 miles an hour and get up. You're, you're done. So, yeah, but I, yeah, I, it was interesting because I did, I had our comms radio on at that time and there wasn't any chatter on that, which was interesting because typically there's something always going on and, you know, it's either a Coast Guard thing or this, and there's always our police radio, you know, cause we're tied in with the police radios. Your cue would have been if there was chatter. There was, yeah, there was no chatter. And you would it. know that it's something. Right. So that's why I started sending texts out. I'm like, guys, I'm not getting any real notification chatters on a, on, on a secure channel. This doesn't make any sense to me. I'm going back to bed. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And Phil, meanwhile, you see your life passing in front of your eyes. Well, I, I think I called Pat and Pat told me that same thing, but it's like, okay, you know, maybe the comms are down or, you know, something, you know, and, but, I mean, to, to physically see that on your phone, this is not a drill, yeah. you know, you're just like, wow, you know. Are there bomb shelters around Hawaii, like World War II era bomb shelters? There actually are. There, um, on Maui, there are some uh, bomb shelters uh, around. They're obscurely located. And, you know, if you didn't know where they were, you probably never find them. It, it's interesting when, when we moved up country, uh, so, you know, what we consider up country, so Maui is, is two mountains and a valley in between and, you know, Haleakala, which is, you know, over 10,000 feet in elevation, uh, we consider that up country. So we lived up in Kula, which was about 2,200 foot elevation. Um, and there are actually, uh, locations up country that have um bomb shelters that are one foot thick concrete you know and maybe the size maybe it's i don't know it's a maybe a 20 by 20 structure that were placed all throughout up country hmm. and what happened was and when my dad was doing some developing here he bought a piece of property had one of these things on it and it became uh, I, I think he used it as a tool shed or something, you know, in the house. 
right? So it became part of the structure of the house. Oh, and so, Bill, they used to bomb Kohalabi back then still. So. Yeah, yeah. So For when, like a practice range? Yeah, so yeah. Kohalabi is another island that's part of Maui County. We, you can see it from Maui County. And it was uninhabited. And it was bombed, you know, I think all the way through maybe late 70s as target practice from the Navy. And so we would be sitting out eating dinner on the lanai and you would see flares being dropped and then you'd hear explosions. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and it was, it was it, it's crazy things happened here that people don't, you know, and, and it was a whole, um, you know, a lot of the local uh, activists finally got the government to stop. Um, and have subsequently had to go in and uh, either detonate or remove ordinance that are on that island. It's still uninhabited. Right. Um, and it was devastated. You know, they had to replant trees and, you know, there, it wouldn't get any rain because there was no trees to d attract the rain clouds and all this stuff. So it's finally starting to come back. Um, and it's still off limits because there are still ordinance that, you know, are unexploded. And so it's a liability factor. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a project now that is undertaken by the state and a lot of the, you know, the, the local organizations to reforest and, you know, bring life back to that island. Holy cow. I, you know, I, I, I heard this story. I heard it on that podcast, but to hear it from the two of you first person on what you both, you know, to hear Pat's humorous, I went back to bed and to hear you Phil. uh, you know, you're like me. I've, I've never been in the military. My brother's been, in, my brother's in the army. He did communications actually like you, Pat. Uh, he went in the first wave in 2003 in Iraq. Um, but I, I don't, I don't come from that experience. And so I imagine that I would just be an absolute terrified mess <laughs> if that message comes through. Yeah. So yeah. I, I know everyone listening here certainly appreciates hearing the, the two of you and hearing your, your first person experience. Uh, we're, we're running tight on time, but uh, I, I did realize that I, I had one more image uh, and I'm going to change the image here. We'll see if I can get my, my screen to cooperate. Oh, you know what? No, it's not that image. Give me a second. I want to, uh, let's see if I can get my screen to behave. There we go. Pat, oh, one more I fun image. Yeah. I, 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 I follow you like maybe many do on social media and you're always posting your different adventures. And I always see you on Facebook like lifting weights underwater. And I'm, I'll be honest, I really don't know what the hell you're doing, but it looks really <laughs> interesting. So I, I, I grabbed a picture from Facebook. So what, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> so the, the gentleman to my left in the photo, I'm the one that's kind of bloated up there on the far right. Dave Kerner uh, is actually on the, or at least he was. Um, I, about five or six years ago when he and I first met, we were all trying to figure out better, not better, but other ways to get workout done as we're getting older, you know, I'm in my fifties now, you know, joints and, and things like that start getting a little wacky. So we started doing some stuff that I did in the, in the service as a, as a special operator, you know, we use a lot of water to do certain maneuvers. And one of them was uh, I, what we call hypoxic training, where we're learning how to deal with over breath holding uh, to, to, to learn how to gain more capacity, lung capacity. So he was like, ah, oh, that sounds interesting. So we, we started doing some stuff that the MMA guys do. BJ Penn has done it for a while. A lot of the big wave surfers. You like guys know BJ Penn? I do, yes. I mean, in fact, that's a, another story for. A oh, dude, story. I I gotta call you after. We'll do that on the after show. We'll talk yeah. about. I'm, I'm a big <laughs> MMA fan, so yeah, yeah. that'll be fun yeah. to talk that, about. That's another fan. business adventure, but uh, yeah. So we started doing this about four or five years ago. Uh, Dave and our our crew has expanded. Uh, we're doing this at a beach called Kamoli One here in Kihei, and it's a sand bottom, so it allows us to do that. We started out with rocks at first because we just 
you know, I didn't want to go buy some weights and they rust out and this, that, and the other thing. Well, Dave got smart and he's like, dude, why don't we get something that's encased in plastic like a kettlebell? This is like two years ago. I'm like, great, let's do it. So we started doing that. And a matter of fact, if you look behind, it looks like a, a, a stingray, but it's not. It's actually an in, um, in water parachute. So we're getting more stupid and stupid, but it does work uh, at certain depths. Again, you got to be real safety conscious. So we always have a safety brief with our team. Um, Dave is a, a, is a physical therapist, so he knows a lot about how the body's going to react in certain things. So getting his knowledge behind it, my knowledge, you know, from the service side of things and then looking at Laird Hamilton and what some of the big wave surfers are doing. So we're not just running the rocks, but we're actually doing a full workout in the water. So less joint manipulation. Uh, you really got to think about it at depth. Once you get to about 10, 12 feet, the ocean itself acts like a, a, a body sock, you know, a compression sock. So there's more protection to that. You're um, at two you're G's at what? 10, 15 feet, 10 feet. Yeah. It's about 10. Yeah. So you're we're one, we're one atmosphere now. over you. Um, what's that? You're at an additional atmosphere, right? Correct. Uh, yeah. Correct. And, and it's all breath old. We're not doing any tanks or anything to that effect. Um, but we've added a bunch of new uh, uh, weights and, and different apparatuses to expand uh, the workout. And, and are you literally that. inventing all of your work? Are you like following a book or routines or you guys are like writing the script as you go? We're just throwing stuff there and see what sticks. <laughs> And having fun doing it, you know, there's no cost to it. There's no gym membership. Uh, we're up to about, oh, I don't know, 10, 12 people now that are in the water. Matter of fact, sometimes our reps will come out. Uh, we're trying to get Chad out here to do it with us. Robert Melendez. Before I'll totally do that. I, I love oh, the water. I, yeah. I love swimming. I mean, I, I in my youth, I swam for many years. And, and how long can you hold your breath? I'm about a two-minute breath hold, but I, I want to get to where I was in that four- Three and a half, four minute range. I'm not close to that at all at this point. Three and a half, four minutes? Yeah. N not under exertion, though. No, no. Well, okay. So, see, there's two differences. You have a static hold and you have a dynamic hold, right? So, the world record on static is, I think, like 25 minutes. And That's I think it's a female crazy. out of Paris that holds that. The, the, the breath hold for dynamic movement, I think, is around 15. So, this is all movement. You're like a human dolphin. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you have to you have to learn crazy. how to, to to reduce the amount of extra energy that you can expel. So that is a part of this that we do is we'll train how you know how to dive properly and how to get down. Uh, um, forgive the term, but we call it asses up. You got to get your butts in the air to get down and use as little amount as energy to get down to the weights. Um, and something that we've incorporated, and I don't think anybody else has done yet, and I'm not trying to say that Laird hasn't, and they probably have, but one of the ladies brought in, um, uh, it's, it's a ball that's got a handle on it, and basically you can hold on to the handle at, say, about 10 foot of depth, and you're just doing a decompression and just hanging there, and it just feels great. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're doing all this running. So we have multiple weights. We have multiple, multiple of these hippity hops is what they're calling it. Um, and basically you can have one group doing static stretches, just hanging with, with the weights on your feet. You put them on your feet and you're just hanging there with a, a static stretch while the others are doing some kind of, you know, uh, overhead presses or whatever the case may be. But we're, we're always having a safety person, uh, at all times. We have the balls just in case we've got to grab onto something and there's always somebody tracking somebody else at all times. Wow. I love it. I, I can keep talking to you guys, uh, but I'm, I'm looking at the time and I already see this is the longest podcast we've ever done. So <laughs> in four years, so well, when else you have bomb threats and people. Well, water it, it, and there's, there's no doubt. This is one of the more eclectic shows uh, we've done, uh, but that's, I, I knew you guys would bring it. So there's no surprise there. Um, well, well, I want to thank you both for coming on the show. This is Automation Unplugged, show 146. Well, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm disappointed that it took us this long to, to get on the show. You know, 146, really, we should have been in the top 100 at least. You know? I knew that was coming. I, you, you know, but I, how about this? So the, the next sign or signal of power and strength is that I'm definitely going to have you guys on again. So the, the next status symbol is the repeat. Repeat. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of like SNL, you know, yeah. 
people that host SNL kind of thing. Okay. Uh, Exactly. And I see that in your future. I, I have no doubt we're going to get lots of great <laughs> feedback from, from this fun, uh, this fun show. Uh, Pat, I'll start with you uh, again. Thank you for coming on. How can anyone that wants to get in touch with you, maybe to learn about hypoxic training or anything else that you've talked about, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Sure. No problem. So we'll plug the business first, Pacific Audio Communications. You can just go to packhawaii.com, P-A-C-H-A-W-A-I-I. Matter of fact, I'll throw it on the, the chat here in a minute. Uh, you can also get me at patm at packhawaii.com. That's also on the website. Uh, call me, my number, 808-870-1615. Anytime. There, thank you, Ron. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, you know, both uh, personally and professionally, both ways. So, yeah, if you're coming this way and you want to get in the water or whatever, let, let's do it. Awesome. Same, uh, same to you, Phil. How, how can people that want to learn more about, uh, you or get in touch with you? How can they do that? Yeah. I mean, same, same contact through the business. Um, or, you know, my email is phil at packhawaii.com. Um, I am on Facebook. I'm, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, um, you know, all of those, uh, social media devices. Uh, and you know, my, my phone number, uh, 870 uh, 1619. So Pat's 1615 and I'm 1619. We got our phones just the same time. In fact, I, isn't Julie's uh, number in that range too, Pat? Yeah, she's, uh, yeah. I, we, we don't need to say it, but yeah. So, so we bought a bunch number of phones. Of you. Yeah, we bought a bunch of phones all at the same time. So we all got 1615. Sequential 167. numbers. Yeah. yeah. And so a lot of the guys that originally worked for us have those numbers still. Uh, you know, or, or had those numbers, those sequential numbers. So, yeah. Got it. Well, both of you gentlemen, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, and uh, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. No, thank you. It's in the comments wrong too. So awesome. Play. Good man. Good man. All right, folks, there you have it. That was show 146. Uh, that was, that was a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie. Listening to that bomb threat story from phil uh i could just imagine and channel the fear that he must have uh experienced that's just uh absolutely terrifying and uh these these guys run a, a great operation uh they're well liked and well regarded around our industry around the world uh i've i've fortunately gotten to know them over uh the recent years um you know, we worked together for a bit back in the early days of One Firefly, and then we we reconnected some years ago, and uh, they're just they're a blast to work with. So it was a it was a lot of fun. All right, so if you're out there watching and listening, and you do not already subscribe to the podcast, remember this is the video. If you're watching me right now, this is the video, and uh, but this is also this can be in your ear holes if you prefer that method of consumption. So if you're like me and you like to uh, walk or run or exercise, maybe when you're on your Peloton bike um, and you want to listen, just subscribe and you can listen to all of our guests. Uh, so please, uh, please do that. And uh, again, if you want to learn more about One Firefly or get in touch with myself or any member of my team, uh, just give us a call or you can go to onefirefly.com. On that note, uh, I wish you all uh, a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to have to reconnect now with Pat and Phil because I forgot to wish them a good Thanksgiving uh, before we we ended the show here. But uh, I will see you guys soon. Actually, we're going to do another show tomorrow. So tune in. Uh, we're going to have John Robbins on. John Robbins with the HTSA Buying Group. So uh, come on for that special. John and I are going to have a blast. And uh, I'll see you guys soon. See you tomorrow.